Welcome everyone to this video conversation in a new series sponsored by the Ecodharma, the Rocky Mountain Ecodharma Retreat Center um, on Ecodharma, this video series. Um, my name is David Loy. I'm one of the founders and one of the teachers up at the Ecodharma Center. And today I'm very pleased to be talking with Johan Robbins, who is another one of the founders. In fact, the one I think who's done more than anyone else to sort of make the Ecodharma Center successful. Uh, and also another teacher. In fact, Johan and I regularly co-teach uh, up at the Ecodharma Center. Um, anyway, welcome, Johan. Thanks, David. It's great to be here with you. Virtually. I mean, it also feels a little bit strange because, uh, well, first of all, you and I are really good friends and you only live a couple miles away. So having a conversation this way seems quite strange, but I think it's better for, you know, for communicating and for the other people listening in. Um, I, I'm really interested in sort of getting down to your spiritual trajectory, tra trajectory in terms of, uh, you know, how your practice evolved into becoming an insight teacher and an insight teacher who focuses, has been focusing, was focusing on uh, meditation and nature. And that's how I uh, also became connected with you. And then gradually evolved from that into Ecodharma and really uh, doing so much to make the Ecodharma Center uh, successful. So I'll just ask you that leading question and get out of the way and uh, give you an opportunity to say whatever you like. Yeah, great. And feel free to prompt me with more questions because that's that's a lot or stop me sure. too sure. much. But um, so like many people in our generation, um, I started meditating in college doing TM when Maharishi's photo was on the wall of every, probably every college and university in the West and Europe for sure. Um, so I started doing TM and found that to be helpful. Um, although I, I didn't get into like the whole world that they were, you know, the, they were selling advanced courses with levitating and promises of all this stuff, but, yeah. But I did start a, a regular practice, which I never, um, I never really stopped. But I had also um, had a long interest in nature. I was backpacking even in high school. I was like taking the bus up to state parks um, near where I grew up in Long Island, and I would go to upstate New York by myself and with friends and go backpacking. Um, so I was very interested in that kind of experience, even from a young age. And somehow my, my sense of spirituality and my sense of being in nature co-evolved or coexisted. They never felt separate. Mm -hmm. uh, what I was after with meditation was the same thing I was after being alone, especially being alone in nature. And um, during college and after college, I started doing extended backpacking trips alone. And I started um, practicing um, different kinds of meditation with a group here in Boulder. And it, it wasn't insight, it wasn't TM, it was, it was more open awareness. Hmm. And so I did that for many years. And, and then somewhere around 25 years ago, um, I encountered an insight teacher Eric Colvey, who was doing backpacking retreats. And I was totally blown away that there was actually a, a teacher in the lineage who was doing backpacking retreats. It was actually combining these things that I've been sort of on my own fumbling around in my spare time, so to speak, um, combining. And so I started doing regular backpacking retreats with Eric he would do 10 or 11 day retreats and mostly in the desert, but did a couple in the Sierras as well. And we would, we would do um, uh, one, usually a one day solo, a one night solo, a 24 hour solo in the middle of that retreat. And these were very silent 
they kept it very quiet. And he had this couple, Terry Gustafson and Betty Jo Black, and Terry was a uh, park ranger, retired national park ranger. And Betty Jo was our cook. And so they took care of all the logistics. Terry was the guide. And it was quite smooth and organized and quite intense. I mean, we had flash floods, we had freezing cold weather, we had baking heat, we had windstorms. It was wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Being out in the desert, being challenged physically, backpacking, and and really deep silence and really deep, deep practice. Um, so I grew to appreciate that. And then after years of doing those with Eric, um, sometimes doing a couple a year with him, he he was getting older and he started really having a lot of back issues and didn't feel like he could backpack anymore. And I had also been doing some wilderness canoe trips with friends, uh, flat water canoe trips on the Green River through uh, uh, Stillwater Canyon near Canyonlands National Park in Utah. And so I said to Eric one time after the trip when he was in, in quite a lot of discomfort from mm -hmm. having done the backpacking um, and, and saying I, he didn't think he could do it again next year. And I said, well, why don't we do a canoe retreat? And those fateful words, why don't we do a canoe retreat? And he just lit up because he said, oh, I love canoeing. I've been canoeing my whole life. I never even occurred to me to do a canoe retreat. I, he said, I wouldn't know how to handle the logistics. And I said, well, I'll guide it for you we'll do it together. And so that next year, he didn't do the backpacking retreat. And we did an experimental canoe retreat. It was a hybrid. It wasn't totally silent. Uh, we invited a bunch of Dharma friends. And we basically just tried it out with about 10 or 12 people to see how it would go and if it made sense. And uh, we learned a lot. And it worked. And so the following year, we did it again, and he was the teacher, and I was the guide, and we did it a couple more years, and then he um, asked me if I wanted to teach. He invited me to start training as a Dharma teacher. My practice had gotten to a certain level where, um, and become more and more a bigger part of my life over those years. Um, so he basically invited me to start teaching and I said Eric I'm not ready to teach but I'll I'll be an apprentice basically so I started a multi-year apprenticeship process with Eric where we would he would start to give me more and more dharma responsibilities not just guiding these retreats mm -hmm. and at some point I started teaching in Boulder uh, doing groups and classes and then at a certain point over a bowl of oatmeal in the wilderness, <laughs> he gave me Dharma transmission and uh, retired from doing the retreats. And basically then I started doing them. And I think a couple of years later, you and I met and uh, we started doing them together. And you and I, I did. I, I remember the first one I did uh, with you and of course, I hadn't done it before, so I came just as another yogi, uh, and I have to say it was wonderful. And just just that experience, uh, I was hooked, as as you were. You know, the combination of being out in the natural world and Dharma practice, it just seemed a really natural one. And I have to say, you know, I'm. This is something I've mentioned before in various contexts, but I'm just struck in how many of the spiritual traditions it involves the 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 seeker who later becomes the teacher the founder whatever you know going off by themselves into the natural world you know think of Moses and and Jesus forty days and forty nights in the wilderness and Muhammad his cave and Milarepa his cave and of course the great example the Buddha himself who you know when he went on his spiritual quest he left home and where did he go? He went into the forest. And so there's definitely something really, really powerful there. 
Anyway, sorry, I just oh. wanted to add that, but please, yes, go well, ahead, think, continue. You know, I think part of the interesting thing of, of what you're bringing up there is the role of being alone and then the role of Sangha. And I know for myself, um, I did several extended backpacking trips that were completely alone. Um, many for four or five days, but I did a, a couple that were uh, two weeks or in the two week range, 16 days, I think was the longest. That was the most food I could carry. Mm. And I was staggering. <laughs> but, um, but that was quite powerful, those experiences mm. of being alone and dealing with all of the different kinds of things that come up, fear, ecstasy, uh, you know, physical challenges, staying up all night in a full moon above tree line, just amazing kinds of things that mm -hmm. happen. But I also know that one of the things that happened to me doing those backpacking retreats and then canoe retreats for so many years was starting to experience very deep sangha, very mm -hmm. real sangha, not trans not a transitory sort of casual sangha, but a kind of sangha where everybody is working together, practicing together, cooking and paddling and hiking and setting up camps and taking care of each other in a mm. really beautiful way. And those experiences of sangha for me were very inspiring in terms of what, what's possible creating sangha where it's very different than going to a meditation center and sitting in rows with a hundred people and you have no idea who's there. And they're basically just other people that are part of the scenery in a way or part of the backdrop of the building. They, mm. they, you know, they're not really, you're not really in a sangha where there's relation, there's relating going on. But being on these wilderness trips together, even though we were silent, there was, they were so small and we were so intimate and we were the only humans mm. in this vast space. I remember, yeah. You know, so there's just this, this love affair that you start silently with everybody um, that I really enjoyed. And, and, and what I remember too, though, well, both from the, the, the river trips and the kind of eco dharma retreats we now do is, so we have Sangha and, you know, living together 24 seven makes a huge difference, but we also incorporate a, a solo, you know, a one or more often now a, a two night solo. So you get a taste of both uh, or you, you integrate both in a way. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and I've also <clears throat> felt that that, that was something that I always wanted to incorporate. That was part of those um, early wilderness retreats mm. where we would do a one night solo, but now we're doing two night, three day solos that are by many reports of participants, hugely impactful, mm. very important to them and very moving experiences that people get prepared for. They don't, they don't just yeah. kick them out of the, center, <laughs> but there's quite a bit of, of confidence that people go out with in terms of their mm -hmm. practice and the logistics and their safety and whatnot. But I think people have really deep experience and appreciation for being able to do that. that that's clear. And so can you tell us a bit more about how the wilderness retreats, such as we were doing down the Green River in Utah, how did they evolve into an eco-dharma concerned and an eco-dharma center? Well, I think you might remember it, it came out of the solos because we started, you know, people would go out on a one or even two night solo, I think towards the end of the um, canoe retreats, we were doing two night solos. And that left you and I a lot of time to sit on the river <laughs> bank and talk and we, mm we would have discussions about what was <clears throat> what was really good about what we were doing and what we want to change. And, um, and as, as time passed, I think we were both understanding that even though these were really cool retreats to do 
and to teach. One, it was a lot of work. Two, they weren't accessible to a whole lot of people. It was a very narrow band of people who'd be willing to do that. And <clears throat> three, it, we couldn't do it more than once a year. It's just too much work. I mean, there was a few years where I did two river retreats, um, but it was just getting to be a lot of work for um, not that many people that were getting reached with it. So the idea I think that we first came up with was let's rent, rent a place. And then we rented um, the place in Marble, mm. which was in a really beautiful part of the uh, Colorado Rockies down in the Maroon Bell Snowmass Wilderness. And we had an amazing retreat there, but the place was a mess. <laughs> I, mean, I remember the cooks, the cooks were horrified. We try, we know, we bring our own cooks, and one of them is Alice, my wife, and she was just like appalled at the state of the, mm. the place, the kitchen, and the way that the infrastructure there. So, we I looked really hard to find that place. I mean, mm. I looked at so many places in Colorado, and they're either mm. very expensive or not in the right location or too noisy or. In this case, it was perfect, except it was super funky and they just weren't taking care of it. Mm. So then it was like, well, renting a place isn't really the best. We can't find the right place to rent. So then it was like, well, maybe we could buy a small piece of land in the mountains, I remember. undeveloped land, and just build a pavilion like with a covered area. So if it rained, we could cook and we could have like bare lockers and some pit toilets and some water supply. And then that would make it a lot easier to do like um, retreats in the mountains. Because I was also, I didn't mention this, but you, I don't think you did any with me, but I was doing backpacking retreats every year too while we were doing river retreats. Mm. I remember and, that. But so I started looking for a small piece of land in the mountains near here. And then I saw what eventually became the Eco Dharma Center uh, that was available. And it was way more than what we were looking for. <laughs> but Alice and I went up there, we drove up, you know, it's like, why not? We'll take a look. And we walked out on the deck of the lodge. And I just said, oh my God. <laughs> it's the same thing that happened to me when you first took me out there. And again, it was the deck looking out at the. Uh, at, at the mountains. And I just realized, you know, this is providence. This is too amazing. It's like, we, we, we have to do it. We have to make it. And, and it's like, it's not even a, it, it's not an ego thing. It's not a decision. It's like, this is being put in our hands and as a responsibility to, to make it happen. Yeah. Yeah. I felt like, you know, the more that I pondered it, that I felt like it was an assignment from the universe. And yeah. I don't want to say that in some kind of cosmic way it just felt like yeah. you know and alice was like don't do it let somebody else do it it's, so, it's too much work <laughs> and i was like i know but there is nobody else who's going to do this because we're going to do it because mm. this is who's going to do it and and it's been a ton of work but it's it's pretty awesome that we that we have it and the way that we got it and um the way that the tradition of that place, it's always been in the hands of a nonprofit that was doing spiritual yeah. practice up there um, from the get go. When, when Hazel built the lodge in 1939, um, she built it as a spiritual retreat center. Hmm. So it's been 80 some odd years of that's what's up there. If I could just add a little bit, uh which I think was kind of implicit in your story here. Um, I mean, part of the problem with the river retreats and the advantage of the Eco Dharma Center is that there was more opportunity to do what we now call Eco Dharma. It wasn't just meditating in nature, but but I remember on on the river trips, I mean, we're we're very busy coping with the elements. And I remember, you know, some uh, amazing experiences with mosquitoes or weather or sleeping next to a whole wall full of black widows. I mean, it's like there were 
there were reasons why there were limitations built into that and the opportunity to really go more deeply and apply sort of Buddhist practice, Buddhist principles and teachings to the ecological crisis. That would have been really, really hard to do on those river retreats. And I think that was for both of us and for many of us, that was a, a big attraction for having a, a more fixed, fixed center there. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, we would both give talks around those topics, but there was a, a lot of the focus was just being out there and right. working with all of the different things that happened um, and getting down the river and or getting up the trail and the backpacking retreats. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of challenges, a lot of interesting dynamics and situations, but not necessarily related to so. ecodharma or the larger world. Um, and I think also just in terms of numbers, I mean, you know, if I was doing two retreats a year, or we were doing one and I was doing another, um, you know, that's like 40 yogis. Um, right now, the Ecodharma Center, we're working with hundreds and hundreds of people every year. Hmm. It's a vastly larger impact. Hmm. Hmm. And, and we still have the beautiful natural world. I mean, it's quite amazing. I mean, it's not the ever-changing green river and the canyon walls, but we have incredible views of the mountains and meadows full of wildflowers and uh, a little brook uh, or creek flow. I mean, it's like, and then so many, um, you know, trees, forests. I mean, it's, we're fully immersed in the natural world there. And of course, when you and I do our retreats together, we're outside virtually all the time, weather permitting. So there's still that connection with the natural world, despite the fact that we also are anchored by the lodge and by these buildings there. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's kind of ideal. It's the best of both worlds in terms of working with groups. Um, we, have, we have as much challenge with the environment as we want. And then if it's more challenged than we want, we can, we can duck indoors. <laughs> and and the, the logistics of cooking and bathrooms and water, and that kind of thing are, are vastly simpler. I remember at the beginning of our retreats together this summer, the first day or two, we had a pretty bad experience with the smoke from the wildfires uh, further out in, on the West Coast. And uh, so we, we were lucky we could go inside and pretty much get away from that. And fortunately that that disappeared or mostly disappeared after a day or two, yeah. I felt like it, it affected me and I think everybody emotionally in a way that underlined the Ikradharma content that we were working with. So. That even in this beautiful place, we can't get away from what's happening to the planet, what's happening to everybody. And there was no retreat from that, that there was nothing that we could do about it. And it was disastrous in California. It was absolutely wreaking havoc on people's lives and whatnot, but even that far removed from it, it was affecting all of us emotionally and physically. And also the, the fact that the Ecodharma Center itself uh, certainly was not, is not immune to that problem. I mean, you know, last year, I think we had three fires in the area, which were not that far away from the Ecodharma Center itself. So that that's part of the challenge. We know that there's no guarantee that, yeah, yeah. That, that we will survive. Time. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's they were right. all burning simultaneously. In, in, the in different like, directions. Yeah. yeah. There was one to the west, one to the south, and one to the north. And they were all within a few miles. Yeah. It was a little scary for me. I can see where the Ecodharma Center is in the mountains from my home in just east of Boulder. And I was watching the fires, and I know where the center is. And I was like, horrified. I was like looking at fire maps online going, that's really close. That's not good. So, 
and, so sorry go ahead you know and not not to get like weird about it but i think realistically what's happening in the west right now it's not a matter of if it's a matter of when those forests burn i don't see that there's a long-term prognosis for the pine forests in colorado that's keeping them intact hmm. over the next whatever 20 to 50 years i it just doesn't seem plausible that yeah. um that they, they have a long-term survival plan for these forests. So, I mean, one, one helpful thing for us is actually we have a fire department not very far away on, on Overland Road, very close indeed. So, you know, there's, there's some possibility that if we were exposed, they could maybe, you know, say, save the lodge, but what is the lodge without all the beautiful trees and meadows, et cetera, et cetera, that, that surround it? Uh, if, right. if they all go, yeah. Yeah, no, the, the, the structures can generally, right, our lodge is, I think, knock on wood, it's fairly um, resilient in terms of the way the trees are around it. We've done mm. a lot of work to uh, mitigate the fire danger to the buildings, mm. but the forest is the forest. It's a totally different thing. Um, and the meadow is fine. I mean, meadows can burn and they just come right That's back. True. But That's when the forests burn in this climate crisis, they don't come back. There, there's too much heat, and there's not enough moisture. And um, on the slopes, you get you know, mudslides when it rains and all kinds of problems. And it's really hard for them to regenerate. Mm -hmm. um, it's really difficult to see regeneration in the forests that have burned like 10 years ago in Colorado. Um, it's very different. I remember when Yellowstone burned in the, there's a giant fire in Yellowstone. I think it was in the, uh, when was that? Was that in the eighties? I honestly don't fire. remember. I think I wasn't living in the US at that time. Yeah. yeah, there was a huge fire in Yellowstone. I think it was in the eighties. And I remember going there like five years after the fire and the amount of regeneration in the forest was incredible. It was actually um, better wildlife habitat. They were getting resurgence and all kinds of understory growth and flowers and wildlife. And then another 10 years later, trees were coming back and it was actually quite, it was one of the kinds of fires that causes renewal that they talk about mm -hmm. fire being healthy for an ecosystem. But that was a different ecosystem in a different climate situation. Now we're not seeing that kind of regeneration happening from Western fires. Would you want to say anything about the mechanics, logistics? I don't know what the term is of actually starting, starting the center. Um, I'm not sure how much to get into that, but uh, if there's anything you'd want to add, or we can go right into this question of, uh, you know, what is an ecodharma retreat? Well, we've done a lot of work at the center. <laughs> As you know, when we bought it, it was quite funky. It was built, the lodge was built in 1939 and it hadn't really been significantly updated. Um, there was no heat, no insulation. You could feel the wind inside the building. <laughs> the electrical system was such that yeah. if you tried to make coffee, um, and you plugged in a space heater, the everything, all the few, all the circuit. You know? <laughs> so you're making a really bad choice. Are we going to try to warm the place up, or are we going to have coffee? Not a good choice to make. I, I, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was it was really pretty funky. Um, not enough bathrooms, not enough beds, etc. So we've done. I think 300 plus thousand dollars worth of work on the lodge to bring it up to date. It has solar, it has heat, it has insulation, it has new plumbing, new electric, new furniture, new walls, a brand new kitchen. It's, it still looks like a lodge. It looks like an old lodge, but it's quite a 21st century building on a functional level. It's really cool. I, I people love it. Everybody comes up there, um, really likes it. You know, we, we added a, a deck on the east side that's quite large that has like 
canopy cell in the summer to keep the sun and rain off of it. It's, it's quite the place. Um, so that's been a lot of work. And I, now we're working on the, the cabin. Hmm. That was the original homestead miners cabin from 1885. And it looks like it. Yeah, it's, it was basically rotting into the ground. Hmm. Um, and so we're doing a complete renovation of that. That should be done this spring and will be available for self-retreat, which we have a lot of people wanting to do self-retreat up there. We get asked all the time. We've experimented with self-retreat in the lodge a little bit when we've been had downtime, but it's kind of a large space for one or two people to do self-retreat. It's a little weird. Um, so the cabin is ideal for that. I'm very excited about that opening up and, this spring. And yeah, next spring that should be done. You earlier you mentioned money, and and I think that too was was one of the interesting things because it, it's not as though we had any big funders here. I mean, fortunately, you know, we were able to buy the 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 buildings uh, very inexpensively, but basically it was several several people in, including us who sort of joined together and just kind of pooled our money to to buy the place so it, it it's been a bit of a shoestring operation in that sense it's just sort of we've just sort of made it happen out of our own pockets and then you know opened it up and raised money and many many people have contributed to uh to fixing up the place and we're slowly uh, retiring the uh, the debt that we still have on the uh do you remember about how much that is? How much would, would we still owe on the actual purchase? Uh, so we, you know, we, we formed a, a 501c3, uh, basically a, a, a Buddhist church um, to, according to the laws of the IRS, um, hmm. we, we made it a church and then solicited donations from a lot of people, including the original founders, um, who and I and other people kicked in, but we also were fortunate to run it to some other folks who made large donations and quite a few hundreds of small donations over the years. So that's how we paid for the place. We did get a mortgage of $250,000, which right now is down to, I think, a hundred and Forty thousand dollars. So we've actually worked that down um, hmm. close to half of what it started, and also raised all the money to do all the renovations, all the fixing up. Yeah, yeah. So we're still raising money now to pay off the mortgage and finish the cabin. Um, but we've we've been fortunate to have, you know, the people coming through who do retreats or people that hear about us wanting to donate and help with that and that's also kept the the rates for people doing retreats low and affordable we offer scholarships to anybody that needs one and we don't try to raise money for the capital improvements or buying the land or paying off the debt from the people that do retreat there they just pay for the operating costs um, which we keep as low as possible i think that's worth emphasizing uh, and, and I'm happy you mentioned it, that uh, one of the main concerns when we started it was that we wanted to make it available uh, to as many people as possible, as accessible as possible. And that included, of course, keeping rates as low as possible. Yeah. Yeah. And, and COVID's presented some challenges with that because um, we have quite a few double rooms and a few triple rooms and everything has been a single room with COVID. And so our occupancy is lower, but the costs haven't gotten lower. Mm. So the, the operating costs then are being split among fewer people. So um, that's put a little bit of a uh, imbalance in our operating budget. The, the other issue is, of course, in terms of staffing, that uh, ev everyone on the board uh, has been, uh, you know, all the work that everyone does, no one on the board has ever paid for anything. And likewise, for you as executive director, you have been working very hard to make the center happen. 
uh, but you know, without a without a salary, we're 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 basically down to what one or two people who are resident managers in the summer, and then we do have a couple part time people that are paid hourly for doing the all the details uh, in order to sort of program, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. We have we have two people on staff um, yeah. who are part time. Spaff does our um, web and technology stuff and marketing, and then Kathy is our program manager, and she does all of the coordination with all the retreats that come up and all the um, registrations of all the yogis and handles all that. And, and Spaff yeah. automates that process and then. Kathy administers it, and that's quite a bit of work that they do to just keep everything running. And putting all that together, I mean, we really use the money. We're, we're very careful that uh, the money we receive goes a long way because we do tend to keep ex those kinds of expenses down to a minimum. Yeah. Could, could you say something about uh, Ecodharma retreats? I mean, you know, you and I have been offering them since the beginning. Uh, we do a double one in the summer together. One of them is usually called an Ecodharma retreat. The other one, a more focus maybe on immersion and nature, more of a nature retreat. But we've also evolved as it's going along. And I'm just wondering if you'd like to say anything about what an Ecodharma retreat is and why someone might want to uh, take it, come for it. Yeah. So, yeah, as you, as you said, we have two different parts of the the ecodharma retreat which the first the first part i think what we call it is a training retreat mm. it's a little bit more of a workshop and it's it's long it's 11 days um it includes i mean it's not just a workshop i mean there's a lot of meditation as well it's kind of a combination that it's a retreat with a lot of sitting but there's also a fair amount of interaction as well yeah, yeah. It, it's basically noble silence, but there's a workshop component every day. There's an hour and a half small group, breakout group, mm. and where there's discussion and exercises and Q&A and processing and um, that kind of thing. And then we're, we're working with a progression of Ikadharma concepts and experiences of letting people work with personally, like how they're doing with the state of the world mm. um, and how they're feeling about it, or working with grief or anger or sadness or guilt, um, but also working with appreciation and gratitude and love of nature and doing a lot of immersive nature practice and preparing people for a solo, which is basically two nights and two and a half days hmm. um, and then also working with what people are doing or want to be doing in the world to help the situation towards the end of the retreat we kind of move out into that dimension so each day is a combination of silent practice um, with the group sitting and walking somewhere on the land in nature together and people get solo time each day in the afternoon to practice on their own. Then in late afternoon, there's that hour and a half time where it's what I would call workshop -y or kind of a workshop mm. format. Mm. And there's more sitting together. Um, and then in the evening, we, we have a sit and then we have a campfire Dharma talk, mm. um, which yeah. is really lovely being outside and of course, we're doing this in July, so it doesn't get dark until after nine o'clock. So it's really nice to be out as the sky changes. And right. the fire. Um, I mean, I, I, uh, I, I think that, frankly, the combination or the, the elements work really well together. Uh, a lot of it, I think, we we've learned, borrowed, stolen from Joanna Macy in the sense of, you know incorporating gratitude practice well starting just sort of being in the natural world meditation that's 
more, not about sort of going inside, but attuning to the natural world and then going into gratitude, feeling gratitude. And only after that, as Joanna Macy does, starting to come, you know, to, to get in touch with our grief, angers and fears, as you said, about what is happening in the world. Uh, and it just seems to me that that really works very well, especially because what we add that is so important is you have people living together 24 seven sort of creating that kind of bond and trust, even if we're not talking, you're, you're creating a sense of Sangha, but also that we're mostly out in the natural world. So it's just this, this huge combination, uh, you know, creating a, a group sense of trust, nature, this kind of sequence, and then at the end, as you said, going off on a solo, maybe a, a two night solo, that's just a really powerful, powerful um, practice. And, and I guess it, it, I mean, my, my sense, and I'm, and I know it's your sense as well, that it's really, that it's really working and it, and it's transformative. And I like the way too, and I guess I'm just repeating what you said here, sorry, how at the end, then, you know, there's opportunities for people to sort of ask themselves and each other, well, where do I go? Where do we go from here? How do we embody this in terms of when we return from the retreat? Uh, you know, what are we going to do with our lives in the light of all this? Yeah. Uh, sorry, I guess I repeated a lot of what you said, but... Uh, <laughs> well, you've been just as big a part of creating this. I mean, it's just wonderful, I, I think. And um, I think we're both very excited. Uh, would you want to say something more about you know where we're going to go from here what we're doing what the vision well i want to you know, continue with that okay so that's the first part and then the second week oh. and people some people do both weeks some people right. just do the first some people just do the second hmm. um, and and the first week is mostly for dharma leaders and teachers and people who have been at this for a long time because it's quite intensive hmm. um, and we basically encourage people to come who are teachers and leaders and then learn what we're doing and then steal this and do what you want with it. Just like mm -hmm. you mentioned, we've, we've stolen from Joanna Macy um, with, of course, her blessing. Um, but we want people to come and do this retreat and then take it and do whatever they want with it. Hopefully they steal it and reuse it. Mm -hmm. um, using that word facetiously. Um, but the second week is really a chance for the people who did the first week just to be in a more um, quieter, deeper um, kind of relationship with the retreat center and the Sangha. We don't do the workshop component in the afternoon. It's a pure silent retreat in nature. There is a solo, um, but we're not introducing so much content and material to process so it's really more about just being in nature and going deeply into that and so some people do both and i think they really appreciate the chance to kind of go take that deep dive um, and the interactive component of the first part and then just have time to process it and integrate it the second week but some people just come for the second week and that's open to anybody including beginners and we get a fair number of people it's mm. the first retreat mm. and uh so far we've had a lot of people come for their first retreat that second week and uh, over the years and um they've all stayed until the end and been grateful that's true. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody's ever. <laughs> Nobody's That's ever... a good point. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. Well, so an eight day retreat for your first retreat is a good chunk, you know, or seven day, whatever it is. It's like, mm. it's not a three day weekend. Good point. Um, so where do we go from here? I mean, do you want to say anything about the future where how this might expand or development? Is there anything more to reflect on there? I mean, clearly the ecological situation is not getting better. Uh, my One of the conclusions from that is I think interest in ecodharma is just gonna continue growing. 
do you see us doing more retreats? What what else is it? I'm, I'm, I don't know if you'd want to share your vision of of uh, where, where we go from here. That's kind of what I'm asking. Yeah. Well, as as you know, some people have been showing up the past few years um, that really want to come back and learn more and become part of the teaching team and learn how to bring this back into their sanghas. So we've trained one person, Lynn Wang Gordon from New York, and she's co-taught with us last year or this past year, it's just a few months ago. She's mm -hmm. coming back to teach again next year. And, but there's a couple of people who did the retreat last year as yogis who are coming back to train as teachers this coming year. So when people show up and they have that interest and that enthusiasm and that capacity, um, especially when they're already teaching, but they want to learn more about this kind of eco dharma and nature retreat, then we've been expanding to include that. So we're actually starting to train teachers. Mm. And I find that very exciting. And also, you know, I don't, I don't know where that's going to lead. I don't know what the potential is if we... Mm expand the program here or people start doing it in other locations uh, or maybe both hmm. that that's you know but it's it's certainly possible that but, we hmm. would do more than just the two and a half weeks that we're doing now right i i think it's worth mentioning for for those who aren't so familiar with the center that uh Although it's called Rocky Mountain Eco Dharma Retreat Center, and you and I do Eco Dharma retreats, not all of the retreats that are have that focus. So, uh, I mean, a number of people rent the center. I mean, basically, we don't really have much of a staff, as I mentioned earlier. So most of what's happening is that people, different teachers, different groups, rent for a weekend or a week, uh, sometimes a bit longer, and uh, so there's a lot of things going on there besides just uh, what we have just been describing as uh, eco dharma retreats and even the kind of nature retreats that we do not everyone is going outside as much as we are i think uh, and yeah. sometimes there's more conventional zen retreats or insight retreats but there's the possibility that you know given given the growing challenge of the ecological crisis and and this question of what this means for buddhism how buddhists how buddhism and buddhist teachers and centers how how we respond appropriately to that it's i mean one possibility is we may see that there are more eco dharma retreats uh, scheduled of the sort that we were just talking about yeah yeah and i think we've you know sort of defined an ecodharma retreat and one of hitting one of three benchmarks so to speak um, and one is just a retreat that's a nature retreat that's predominantly mm. engaging with outdoor practice with a practice that is really engaged with what's mm. happening in the environment there that mm. and a lot of the retreats are moving in that direction although as you said some are you know, indoor traditional Zen Sashin or other kinds of indoor experiences, especially mm. in the spring and fall. Um, but a lot of the retreats up there are moving outside more and more. Mm. So that to me is still nature retreats are still ecodharma retreats. Mm -hmm. Another level is retreats that are engaging in more of engaged practice or some way of dealing with what's going on in the world, especially environmentally and socially, um, which we do in the first week of our retreat a lot more than the second week. Mm. Um, and, and then the third is training activists, mm. either training Dharma practitioners in activism or training activists in Dharma practice to support their um, their activism with spiritual right. practice. Yep. So, um, and we've done some of that up there too. You've done oh. some of that up there. Yeah. So, so two years ago, before 
COVID hit, we did have a retreat for activists. A lot of them were uh, Extinction Rebellion people, you know, some of whom had already were already familiar with Buddhist practice, but uh, uh, not not all by any means. And and I think people found that very helpful, you know, combining the sort of two aspects of the Bodhisattva path, you know, continuing to work on your own transformation and your own sort of stabilization, equanimity, but also using that as a support to the kind of activism that uh, is so important these days. Yeah. And, you know, I think we, we both envisage more of that happening um, as, as it becomes more possible and, uh, you know, more in-person retreats are available. The other one, of course, worth mentioning is we did have a retreat, a weekend retreat for local Dharma teachers, um, uh, uh, front range Dharma teachers, uh, partly, I think, or largely even as kind of way of creating an eco Dharma community so that uh, people are networked better and, and more connected with each other. I mean, I'm amazed how many Dharma centers and Dharma teachers there are just in this little area, sort of around Denver, north of Denver, especially uh, up against the up, up up against the mountains, and sort of this I see as as something, and it's already started, but really creating some place of communication and creating a a sangha of sanghas out of that, and it seems really. Um, I I think we were off to a good start, and then COVID hit, so we're still kind of recovering from that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we've been talking for a while. Um, is there anything else that that that's on your mind that you would like to communicate or share? Uh, I don't have any more questions or comments at the moment. So let me just open it up to you if, if you want. So I guess in closing, it'd just be nice to invite everybody to um, join our email list, explore the website, the rmerc.org website, and join our email list so you can become informed about programs and retreats and other things happening, ways that you can get involved and come out on the land. And there's um, a full schedule of retreats every year from late late April until mid-November, usually a retreat every week. Mm -hmm. um, a few of them are David and I, but there's all kinds of other folks coming up there teaching and practicing and, and almost every flavor of Buddhist and contemplative practice uh, finds their way to our work at one point or another during the season. Mm. Thank you, Johan. Thank you. Uh, for this conversation and sharing everything that you have. And most of all, thank you for having done so much, frankly, more than anyone else to make this center possible. And uh, I, like many, many others, are really appreciative of that. And and, and I'll just echo what you said. I, I would love it if more people become involved and uh, can, can join us one way or another, so. Yeah, well, my pleasure, David. Thank you for <laughs> doing this series of, of interviews. It's uh, fun to be the, together doing it virtually. Thank you, Johan. Be well. You too. And uh, I encourage everyone to also check out the other uh, Ecodharma video conversations that are available on our website.